February 6th, 1992, some 40 years back in time. And uh, here we are with the legends of New England under the wing of Herb Pomeroy. In this part of the country, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Herb Pomeroy's name is kind of one of those wispy legends and it's reality tonight at the Dakota Bar and Grill. Herb, it's a privilege to meet you. My pleasure, Lee. I'm pleased to hear here, really be here. We're having a wonderful time. And the Midwest has a warmth that I, I don't find in the East. We're having a great time here, really. Well, for all of it's a treat, uh, you know, sitting out front. And uh, in this age of corporate uh, right-sizing and downsizing, I see you've uh, uh, done the same thing with your band. <laughs> we did. We were a 16-piece band from 1955 until 1983. And in 1983, the handwriting on the wall suggested that 16 men were just going to be too difficult or impossible to work with. So we cut the band from 16 down to 12. And uh, we're glad we're down to 12 because still it's hard to work even now with only the 12 men. 16, if we had 16 men now, I don't think we'd be in business. For those of us who haven't had a chance to get acquainted with you, this band started uh, back around 1955, didn't it? Hit it right on the head. There was a little club in Boston called the Jazz Workshop, and we played there with a quintet six nights a week, tenor, trumpet, and three rhythm. And we decided we'd try a big band one night a week. So we got some arrangements together and rehearsed the band, and we went in there working every Tuesday night. And business worked out well. The club decided they'd do two nights a week. And we were doing Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then things just sort of blossomed. We went to New York and played Birdland in the Apollo Theater and the uh, Carnegie Hall, the Newport Festival, the Cool Festival, and the, the, the one night a week blossomed. And uh, we were not a steady seven night a week band year round. We were a band that would work maybe three nights a week and then occasionally do a week or two at a time. But it stemmed from 1955 in Boston. Well, since half of you are on the faculty of the Berkeley School in Boston, uh, this is got to be a labor of love and also too a kind of a workshop and a laboratory for you. It is. As far as the workshop of love, it, in, if you're in the jazz, it's got to be that. Uh, I, I guess what I, like, what I like to say is first you're honest to yourself, then you're honest to the musicians you're playing with, and then if your integrity carries over to eight or ten people sitting in the audience, it's all worthwhile. You, you just can't expect that everybody sitting out there is going to understand exactly what you're up to. But if a few people have that look on the face like they're getting something from it, that your music is causing them to feel something inside, then the labor of love is well worth it. And as far as the workshop goes, we are fortunate to be situated in a city where we have time to write, rehearse, work out new ideas. So it definitely is a workshop effect, yes. The book itself is just a, a, a wide range of material and uh, certainly almost every genre style tradition is represented and it's fascinating to hear it unfold. Uh, did you set about in any way trying to, uh, you know, just uh, do a historic uh, view of things? No, we really didn't set out to do that. Um, we would, we'd like to think that we are ourselves more than that we are in any way a repertory orchestra or that, that, that our role is to, to, to show jazz history but yet you still have to hark back to your own roots and the roots of some that precede you and in, in a big band sense the, the Ellington band is my band that's the band that I like of them all and hence I do play in the course of needing four or five Ellington tunes or our own arrangements we don't play any of Duke's arrangements so that's the one band that I sort of do go back to we play we just finished the last set doing Dizzy's Things to Come and that's something that I, oh, about once a week I'll play that. The, the guys, some of the guys in the band don't like to play. They say, Herb, that's, that's almost 50 years ago that belongs to Dizzy. And yet, sometimes with the crowd, uh, you'll get an excitement factor going that they get the crowd in your corner so you can do some of your own things. So we do, I think it's more of, a, of an indirect influence that, that, we, that our history is important to us than the direct saying we're playing this band or that band or the other band. It really falls in place rather spontaneously as I suppose uh, days, weeks, and months uh, steam by. <laughs> it really does. We've been doing this for so many days and weeks and months and years. Uh, three of the followers in the band have been with me since the 50s, and so we're a 12-piece band, so that's one-third of the band. We've been playing together since the 50s, and the majority of the rest of the players joined us, I would say, in the mid to late 70s. So we've been steaming by a lot of years, and uh, it gets into decades, which is, we were thinking the other day that we've spanned from the 50s to the 90s. That's five decades of this century this man has existed. Well, on the 
on the other side of the ledger, as far as this experience is concerned, is your your academic uh, stimulation and leadership in the classroom in the setting of Berkeley. And uh, what uh, what's your teaching philosophy in this field? What guides you in, 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 in the development of young musicians and students? Well, that's, that's a very profound question. I could probably go on for 20 minutes here with this. In teaching jazz at Berkeley, I have two elements of teaching. I teach jazz arranging and composition, and then I direct small and large jazz groups, ensembles. As far as the classroom teaching goes, I don't like to have people spit back to me the very ideas that I talk about. I like them to incorporate what I have to say into them rather than have them become clones of what I, the teacher. I like to think that I'm a catalyst for them to be able to find themselves, that I will say something and it will open up themselves to find themselves, to get ideas of their own. I am not flattered, and I tell the, the people in my classes, if you sound like you're writing like I am, or you sound, or you all come out of this course at the end of the semester sound like you're writing the same, then I failed you. What I'm trying to do is merely be that, that can opener, that, that catalyst to get you folks to, to be yourself. So that's my, my basic philosophy in the teaching of jazz writing at Berkeley. What's the reward for you as you uh, uh, see a, a semester or four years roll by and uh, you watch those students and observe them in action? Well, it, it's a mixed sort of thing. The reward to see the development is a great pleasure. To see somebody come into Berkeley and have talent but not have the tools to put that talent into effect and then see them four years later and feel that you've been partly responsible for this person who is now a mature adult musician with something to say musically beyond just having technique. On the other hand, there's a strong frustration there. Where are these people going to go with this material that we have worked I'm not going to say that I've taught them, that we've worked with, that I'm guided, that I've shared with them. Uh, if we as professionals in our 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s are having trouble finding employment playing this kind of music, where are these young people who don't have the contacts, they don't have the reputation, they don't even have the experience? So I'm thrilled to see the development, but I'm frustrated at what the music business holds for them. And on that subject alone, much can be said. Certainly there is the, um, the whole aspect of the way the venues do not develop from uh, hotels and chains that could support a one-night stand or a series of tours to uh, the jazz clubs themselves, which have very little alliance one to the other. Well, no question that the venues aren't there like they once were. This situation tonight, where we are playing here in St. Paul at the Dakota Brown Grill, is one of the nicest situations I and my band have ever been a part of. Lowell Pickett, the gentleman who runs this place, has treated us you feel like, I told Lowell tonight, you feel like you're coming in your own living room and putting your own slippers on. And we've never played here before. I haven't played in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area since 54 with Stan Ken's band. And yet here I sit with my band and feel like I'm in Boston or in my own living room. So this, this is unusual. If, if there were 50 clubs like this around the country, then the venues would be there for us, but there are not. You either find a place where it's dirty, or the acoustics are bad, or the piano's out of tune, or the owner tries to cheat out of some money, or something is wrong. To come and have it all be right, you almost are wondering, when's the shoe going to drop? Because there are so many of these areas in jazz that the shoe drops on you too often, really. So the venues are there, but they're, they're, they're relatively few and far between. They do not exist like they did in the 50s when I became active with my band. Wish there were more places. <laughs> Looking back just to an experience and learning process, the Street Academy uh, side of learning, riding the bus with Stan Kenton, what was that like? Well, I never liked being a road person. I, I first went on the road with Lionel's band, Lionel Hampton. I played about six months with Ham's band. Then I went out with Stan's band for about six months. And after that, I came off the road. I'd gone to Harvard for one year before I be went into music. I got out my philosophy and my German and my calculus books, and I started to review and was going to go back to Harvard in the fall. I was so frustrated. But something said, no, give it one more whack. So I kept hammering away at it. But the road was not for me. But I must say that, the, the, as you call it, the academy of the streets or whatever, it is, there was a, that's a great learning process. I, I feel that it's great that we have the, the music schools where people can use to learn technique. But they're somehow learning something through practical experience, which is what we mean by the street, is, is almost a better way. It sometimes takes longer, maybe more difficult, but 
when you learn something from experience, I think it sticks, sticks with you longer than when you learn something in, a, in an academic, a truly academic situation. And you certainly have combined both. The, the Turing and Street Academy of Lionel Hampton and, and Stan Kenton and uh, the hallowed halls of Harvard and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and the Berkeley School of Music. Right. Well, uh, I'm glad that I've done all those things. I think they, they have broadened me. And whatever I am as a musician, I'm a result of all those experiences in my present environment. So I am pleased that I had the, the street experience. I'm pleased that I, I saw that I didn't want to stay at Harvard. My father was a dentist. I didn't want to be a dentist. I wanted to be a musician. I am pleased that I've had some education in the classroom. because I went to Berkeley as a student back in 48, 49, and 50 before I went on the road. So it has been broad. I've learned street-wise, and I've learned uh, academically both. Well, just a, sort of a quick aside, and I know uh, it's almost uh, the end of intermission here. Uh, you were going to school with some interesting student, fellow students and colleagues. Yes. Well, probably the one best known, because he's been so successful musically and commercially, is Quincy Jones. Quincy and I were classmates at Berkeley back in the the, the school year 1950-51, and we've remained friends over the years. Um, other people that went to school with uh, Charlie Mariano, the great jazz alto player, was a, uh, a classmate of mine. Um, there are other people, maybe they're not quite as well known who were there at that time. Uh, Ray Santisi, the piano player in Boston, he and I were classmates. A, a giant of a piano player who has never really left Boston, and probably the world doesn't know about this man, but a great, great jazz piano player. So at that time, there were some wonderful young players who've gone on and made wonderful marks. Berkeley has been doing this now for literally for about 50 years. Without Berkeley, uh, the international jazz scene would certainly be a lot. Uh, more undernourished. That's a, a very good point. Uh, at this point, 25% of our student body in Berkeley are foreign students, and I now spend every summer in Europe, and I'm sort of reaping the harvest of some seeds that I've sown in previous decades. The students that I had in the 60s and the 70s are now prominent musicians in their home countries and are inviting me over to lead bands and to teach classes and to play with them. So the, the foreign student that came to Berkeley and then went back to their home country and developed music schools, bands, styles of music, are legion, they really are. And it's great that that's very fulfilling. Herb Pomeroy, uh, I want to thank you very much for taking time here. And if you would just leave me with uh, one thought concerning the language of jazz and what it means to you. Well, what it means to me is it, it's allowed me to have a life that at times was not easy because of the business. but. When I stand on the bandstand and lead my band, and I watch the band enjoying playing the music, and I look out in the audience, and I see them enjoying the music, I feel like I'm sort of this, this in-between entity that has brought together an audience and a band, and it is very, very fulfilling. It, it gives you the sense that you have done a little something to make a few people feel a little bit better about being alive. So music in general, and jazz, which is my kind of music, gives you an awfully nice feeling about being alive. From legend to reality, there's the catalyst uh, speaking. Uh, thank you very much, Herb Pomeroy. It's been uh, just a grand experience uh, being out in the audience, listening to you and your colleagues uh, sowing seeds here in the Midwest. And uh, may they all just mature. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure to be here and to talk with you also.